Good afternoon. Welcome to our, serv- our Harvest Thanksgiving service today as we gather together to, to worship Almighty God and to give thanks for his bountiful provision. It is my prayer that as we gather here together uh, that you will be blessed and that God will be glorified. As is always, I have a number of things to, a number of announcements to make before uh, we begin our service of worship. Now, last week, um, what we, uh, because we record this service now visually uh, and uh, audibly as well, uh, yeah, it has been noted on the, well, I noted it anyway, on the recording that when uh, you hear me singing from the pulpit mic, it sounds like you're doing violence to a cat. Okay? So, so we asked, last week we asked Lynn to mute uh, my mic whilst we are singing. Unbeknownst to me, the people in the hall then thought they, that the, the rapture had occurred because suddenly they heard nothing about the organ playing. Uh, um, so and we're, we're trying something different here this morning. We have two mics positioned at the front of the church and hopefully they will pick up the congregation singing. Uh, uh, so the folks in the hall, uh, please do not be alarmed when you don't hear anything coming from the pulpit uh, during the hymns. Oh, okay. I would like to take this opportunity to, in this now to thank everybody who to, uh, brought gifts and for the, taking the time uh, to decorate the church uh, for the harvest this weekend. Thank you for, for doing that and you have done a, a marvellous job. We have kept things to a minimum once again, but as per usual, uh, yeah, le- you know, less, uh, uh, the, the, the less is more in, in this case. It, it looks really well. Thank you. Tonight at 7.30, we will, God willing, hold our evening harvest Thanksgiving service where the speaker will be the Reverend Jonathan Cowan uh, from Mountjoy and Drumliga. So please make an effort, if you can, to come out uh, to hear Jonathan. Due to COVID-19, there will not be a, due to COVID-19, there will not be a service uh, tomorrow evening. I'd like to remind the members of Kirk Session that we are having a meeting on this incoming Tuesday, the 12th of October at 8 p.m., in Glen Hoy. A PW hope to meet on Tuesday night also, 12th of October at 8pm in the Bailey Hall. The speaker will be Emma Reid, a worker from Child Evangelism Fellowship. A supper will not be served, but ladies are welcome to bring their own thermos, cups of tea and coffee to share together after Emma speaks. And ladies of all, of every age and stage, will be most, made most welcome, so please, if you can, come along to that. Our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting will meet, God willing, via Zoom this incoming Wednesday at 8pm. The login details, as usual, are on the church website, as are a copy of the study notes. So even if you have never been able, never joined with us so far in our Bible study, we're looking at Daniel. Those notes are there for you to download and to use. Youth Fellowship are meeting next Sunday, the 17th of October at 7.30pm in the loft where Gary Tutty from Faith Mission will be the speaker. You should also, on your way in, have been given little flyers for the youth club, highlighting the start date for the youth club and the details of that. Uh, please pray for this, and if you know a young family not connected to the church, but uh, they have children in that P1 to P7 age category, please uh, in your local in local area, please uh, take one of those flyers and, and pass it on to them. There are more there are more flyers at the back of the church here uh, for those who want to take a handful and to hand them out to families with children in that age category. Could I also ask the leaders of the youth club to uh, remind the leaders of the youth club that we will meet at seven thirty on Thursday, the fourth of November, to help set up and then conduct what I call a walk through talk through. So leaders. A meeting on the fourth of November, just to set the set it up. Last week, I, I mentioned the student prayer partnership that those students who are in full time education, secondary level education and above, who have, who have members uh, of the congregation praying for them, could I ask you to update your details for this incoming academic year. The sheet is at the back of the church here for you to do that. If you are a parent with a young person. In, in, that edu- in education, could I ask you, uh, and they're not here, could I ask you to update their details? Also, if you are a young person in, that, in secondary level education and above, and you haven't had anybody praying for you up until now, uh, but you'd like that, could you please contact me, uh, and I will add your name to the list. And likewise, if you're an adult and you would like to be involved in praying, 
uh, for our young people in full-time education, please speak to me and I'll add your name to that list. With regards to uh, COVID-19 and the, the, the uh, slight increase in seating capacity we have now here in the church as restrictions continue to ease, could I respectfully request that as you come to church each Sunday, rather than just head straight to the hall, please come to the church first, as we like to fill the church first, and then you use the hall as, as overflow. So please come to the church first and check and see if seats are available. And then finally, on the, uh, with COVID-19 in mind, I... Um, could I ask you that uh, uh, if you test positive within the, in, in this incoming week, that you ring me and let me know, and I will in due course ring those uh, who are sat in and around you to let them know. So with that, with that in mind, take a look behind you and in front of you to see who is there. So if I have to ask you that question, you can tell me should you have to phone me. Those you'll be pleased to know are all the announcements. Let us read from God's word now, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through, 6 through to 11, just to refocus our minds. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For mine thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. As we consider God's greatness and his blessings towards us, let us stand a singer opening hymn, We Plough the Fields and Scatter.
Let us approach God in prayer now. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together to praise and worship you for all that you have done for us. And today we especially remember how you have blessed us once again with the harvest. We thank you, Lord, for enabling our farmers to get the majority of their crops gathered in. We thank you for the decent spell of weather, which has not only enabled the crops to grow, but also for them to be harvested. Harvest reminds us of your faithfulness towards us, Lord. It demonstrates that your promises do not and cannot ever fail. Nothing you have decreed will fail to come to pass. Harvest also reminds us of your immense power, Because when we consider the beauty and mystery of creation, we recognize that none of this would exist had you not declared that it should. As your word declares, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. These opening words of scripture confront us with the reality that you are the Lord God Almighty and that we are subject to you. They remind us that just as you alone have created us, you alone can recreate us. You alone can transform us from hell-bound sinners to heaven-bound saints. From those who are in perpetual rebellion against you to those who have been reconciled to you. You alone can remove our sin from us and dress us in a robe of righteousness. You alone can do this when we humbly confess our sin to you and trusting only in Christ, seek your forgiveness. We thank and praise you, Lord, therefore, for the wonderful truth truth that Christ died for our sins and rose again, victorious from the grave. We thank and praise you that though our sins may be many, your mercy is always more. We thank and praise you that no one who seeks forgiveness in Christ's name is beyond salvation. As your word declares, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who when he was upon this earth taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're now going to read from God's Word, so if you have your Bibles with you, can I encourage you to open them at our passage of Scripture, which is the day is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 13. So Luke, chapter 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 13. Our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ was speaking to a large crowd of people on verse 13. It says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. 
Take life, e- take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said this to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you are about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. The pagan world runs after all these things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that they will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And we end our reading at verse 34 and thank God for this reading from his truth. Boys and girls, I'm going to speak to you for a few moments. Now there's a word on the screen which I wonder if anybody can tell me what it says. Greed. Well done, greed. Well done, greed. Yes, it means, it says greed, but can anybody tell me what greed means. What do you think greed means? Pardon? Pull your mask down, I can't quite hear you. You want more of something, yes. Want more is a good way of saying it, you want more. It can also mean being selfish, yes. Being selfish and unwilling to share. That's a very good answer. So for instance, when we're thinking about being selfish and unwilling to share, I have a box of Quality Street, which I'm led to believe with the latest shortages in the UK are now starting to get bought up because they think they're going to run out of them for Christmas. Okay? So, okay, Qual- uh, this box of Quality Street. Now, imagine this. If I were to stand here and open this and munch away on these here without offering any of them to you, you would rightly say that I was not only being rude, but greedy. That's right. And imagine if you asked me politely, say, Excuse me, Edwin. I'm absolutely starving. My belly thinks my throat's been cut and I'd like one of them. <laughs> but I said, no way. You're not getting any of these. I'm not sharing them with, with you. Well, then you would think I was greedy, wouldn't you? And extremely rude. And you'd be right. Now, what sort of things do you think, or can you think of that people are not willing to share with others? What about toys when they're younger? Children and toys, what normally with young children, the cause of the major eruptions in a household? Mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, they will not share that toy with me or whatever. Okay. Food, people not sharing the food. Okay. Money, also money, people not sharing money. Now, now being greedy does mean, does indeed mean selfish, but As you said to me a few moments ago, it also means never being satisfied. Always wanting more. Never being satisfied with how much you have. And always, always wanting more. So, for instance, what's that? Money, yes. Some people, you know, are never satisfied with how much money they earn. They always want more. They're always trying to earn more and more money or get more and more money. What 
What about these? I can hear some people laughing already. What do you, what do you call these? Shoes. That's right. Now, believe it or not, there are some people who are never satisfied with how many shoes they have. Okay? They just keep on buying them until, as the man says, the house is falling down with them. And they maybe only ever wear them once. Okay? And what about this? What do you call what we're wearing? Anybody? Clothes. Again, I have to say there are some people who are never satisfied with the amount of clothes that they have. So they buy stuff that they rarely have ever wear. In fact, I walked into the family room the other day and Joanna something on television. There's something on about this girl who bought an outfit, wore it once and then stuck it away. And that's what she did. She just kept buying outfits and then she wore them once. And once she'd worn them, she either stuffed them away somewhere or gave them away. Some people just never have enough clothes. Now those are just a couple of examples of things that people always want more of. But of course there are other things as well. But you know the Bible tells us that being greedy is wrong. It's wrong because it is unfair. As it means that people who have very little and really could do with more are not not able to get what they need. It's also wrong because it causes us to forget about God and to think that we have no need of him when in fact all of us do because all of us have sinned and need God's forgiveness therefore God's forgiveness is the most important thing the most valuable thing that we need but you know the most wonderful thing that the Bible tells us is that God's forgiveness is available to anyone who wants it it doesn't matter whether you are the richest person in the world or the poorest It doesn't matter whether you have hundreds of shoes or none. Whether you have lots of clothes or only a few dirty rags. When we trust in Christ and ask for forgiveness in his name, we are promised by God that we will be given it. God's forgiveness is the most valuable thing that we can own because Christ paid for for him. Christ paid for it himself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world which teaches us that we always have to have the next thing, next best thing. But help us, us, O Lord, to remember that if we have Christ, we need for nothing. That if we have Christ as our Saviour, we need for nothing. Amen. I'd just like to remind you that whilst we do need to wear masks whilst we're singing if you feel comfortable whilst you're sitting with the new regulations you can't take them off whilst you're sitting in, in, the, in the pews but we do ask them to put, you put them on when you are indeed singing we are going to sing again whilst the children head out to children's church we're going to sing uh, it takes an almighty hand <laughs>
let us come before God. Let us come before God once again in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, whilst we live in a country where on the whole we enjoy good harvests, we recognise that for many countries in our world today that is not the case. So we pray for all the countries where a lack of rain has prevented crops from growing or where excessive rain has caused flooding and so destroyed the crops that were growing. In many of these countries, with poor infrastructure and insufficient government aid, the resulting famine claims tens of thousands of lives. Therefore, O Lord, we pray for countries affected in this way. We pray that sufficient international aid would be provided to stop malnourishment and the spread of disease. We pray, Lord, that aid agencies would be able to get the, get the aid to where it is needed and so to prevent a catastrophe. Here at home, O Lord, we pray for our farmers who find themselves operating in an increasingly different, difficult environment with rising costs and dwindling profit margins right across the sector. We pray that things would level out and so enable our farmers to get an acceptable return for their labours. We pray, Lord, that farming would remain a viable occupation for all the young people who will become the next generation of farmers. We pray, Lord, that the current crisis caused by the shortage of workers in meat processing plants and other areas of the food supply chain will be resolved quickly and so, Lord, prevent the culling of animals simply because there's no market for them. May you grant our government and industry leaders the foresight, wisdom and ability, Lord, to deal with this effectively. Finally, O Lord, we remember all those known to us in this congregation who are currently unwell. May, O Lord, they know your healing touch upon them. And may their anxious loved ones know your reassurance and comfort, we pray. And these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles at hand, I encourage you to open them at Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 34, as we read from a few moments ago. Our culture is dominated by materialism, which in short is the belief that our sense of well-being is related to and enhanced by the possession of things, with the theory being that the more you have, then the happier you will be. This means that we then strive to acquire the things which we believe will give us the happiness we seek. However, what the advocates of materialism don't tell you is that once you have acquired what you have set your sights on, you discover that instead of satisfying your desire for happiness, it only whets your appetite for more. Therefore, you strive for the next thing that you believe will bring you satisfaction. But is that all there is to life? When all is said and done, is life just an endless quest to possess things? Well, hopefully your answer to that question is no. But why then are we all guilty of it to varying degrees? Well, the answer to that question lies, you could say, in our DNA, because as humans, we are innately selfish. When God put our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, he told them that they could eat from every tree or plant in the garden with the exception of just one. But despite God's bounteous provision, it wasn't enough for them. Ignoring all that he had given them, they set their hearts on the forbidden fruit and the rest, as they say, is history. From that point forward, humanity has been at odds with God, preferring to do our own thing, as it were, instead of listening to and trusting in him. But 
Whilst we think that this is the road to happiness, it is actually the road to the problems of anxiety, frustration, despair and a whole lot more besides which we see manifested in our world today. We were made by God to have fellowship with and enjoy him. But because our relationship with him is fractured by sin, his absence leaves a void that we foolishly try to fill with other things. However, just like drinking seawater does not quench your thirst, these things cannot truly satisfy us either. Only a restored relationship with God by virtue of having our sins forgiven through faith in Christ can we be truly satisfied. But such is the subtlety of Satan that he would have us believe that even if we have put our faith in Christ, it's not enough. That we still need to be participants in the rat race, as some have described it, in order to be truly happy. That, of course, is a lie. And it is one that we find Christ addressing here in this parable that Luke recorded for us. The setting for this particular parable is explained for us at the beginning of chapter 12, where we learn that a vast crowd had gathered around Jesus and his disciples as he taught them. Jesus had been giving his disciples some warnings and encouragements when an an unidentified man in the crowd butted in, as we might say, and asked the question we find in verse 13, which is completely unrelated to what Christ had been speaking about. So the parable that follows seems out of kilter with what Jesus had been teaching, but it isn't. Because if you weigh up what he had been saying in the previous verses, he was emphasizing the need for his disciples to focus upon and trust in God. This man, however, was thinking only about the acquisition of possessions. That was his focus in life, and Christ knowing where his heart really lay, told this parable to address this issue. He did so, first of all, by issuing a warning against greed. He issued a warning against greed, which we can see in verse 15. But as you read that verse, notice, if you will, that he didn't just say, be on your guard against greed. Rather, he said, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Greed is the insatiable desire for something with the emphasis being on insatiable. It is therefore a form of idolatry in that what we desire becomes the object of our affections. Greed also turns you inward. So you think only about yourself making you insensitive to other people, fueling disagreement and disharmony in the process. So you see, greed is toxic not only to the person it snares, but also to their relationship with others. Therefore, as Jesus states, we need to watch out. We need to be alert and on our guard against it, lest it snares us. But as Christ points out here, there are different types of greed, so it's not just one particular thing we need to be wary about. That is because we can be greedy for Different things, such as the acquisition of wealth. Millions of people across our nation play various lotteries or indulge in the many other forms of gambling that are available in the hope that they will get rich. Others will work all the hours that God sends simply to accrue wealth. Or there's the acquisition of possessions. Those possessions can come in all forms, such as clothes, phones, cars, furniture, art, land, property. You name it. If it exists, some people just have to have have it, regardless of their income or whether they actually need it. Then there's the acquisition of power or position, or authority. Some people are always pursuing the next level of promotion at work, doing anything that they think will impress their superiors. Then there is the acquisition of status. Now, although I have placed this last on the list, 
It is the one that usually drives all the others. We want people to respect, admire, or maybe even fear us. So we will use some or all of the others to acquire the status we desire. And some of these things in and of themselves may not be bad. But if they become the thing or things by which we want to be defined by, then they are a problem. They are so because we have made them into a God that we are willing to sacrifice for and to. They are things that we will justify to ourselves, even at the expense of others. So that family relationships and friendships are shattered. And not only that, the pursuit and acquisition of these things can result in us disregarding God. Presuming that we have no need of him, so whilst shattered human relationships is tragic, a fractured relationship with God is catastrophic. That is the danger of greed. That is why we need to be warned about it. Jesus, knowing this, didn't just issue a warning against greed, though, and leave it at that, because he went on to point out the folly of greed. He did so by way of the parable about this farmer who had such a bumper harvest that his existing barns were too small to store it all. Therefore, he decided to demolish them and build bigger ones and take life easy after that. Now, from a human perspective, at first glance, this man's plan seems sensible, given the circumstances. But that is because we can easily miss key facts that Jesus mentions. Jesus didn't merely describe him as a man or landowner. Rather, he described him as a rich man. So this man had already been greatly blessed by God in that he had already accrued considerable wealth. Then as we read on through verses 17 and 19, if you notice, it is a constant repetition of I and my. I will do this. My crops, my grain, my goods. This points to the fact that this man thought only of himself, not others, and certainly not of God. He was already, he was already a rich man, but that obviously wasn't enough for him. So he planned to lay up his extensive treasure for himself alone. This man thought he was wise, but he was in for a rude awakening because, as our text tells us in verse 20, Jesus said, But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Now, fool in our culture is a strong word because in essence it describes someone who does not listen to or chooses to ignore the facts and instead does their own thing. But in the biblical sense, it's even stronger because it describes someone who chooses to ignore God. Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool in his heart says, There's no God. In Psalm 10, verses 3 and 4, it says, Such a person, it says, describing such a person, it says, He boasts of the craving of his heart. He blesses the greedy but reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. In other words, such a person is completely dismissive of God. They take no account of God's all seeing eye his righteous judgment and his power to deal with them. The man in this parable was just such a man. He thought he was wise, but actually he was foolish because all that he had striven for, all that he would taken pride in, all that he would taken a sense of security from, all that he would staked his hope of future happiness on, would be given to someone else. It was not taken from him. He was taken from it. But not only that, all his money and all his possessions, which he had placed so much store in and laboured intensely for, bought him nothing in the end. And actually, it cost him everything. This man had ignored the fact that it is the Lord who gives us life and takes it from us. And he found to his cost that all he had placed his hope in 
would in fact condemn him. Christ put it another way. What good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Christ's words here challenge us to recognize that there is nothing we can give in exchange for our souls. We cannot buy our way out of hell. The wealth we have here in this world will be as valueless as a pile of rust is to us now when we stand before Almighty God. Therefore I wonder, what about you? Are you a fool because you have rejected God? Will you, when God calls you to stand before him, find that you have forfeited your soul? Some of you may, of course, think that you cannot be accused of, accused of such foolish, foolishness, given that you do profess to have faith in Christ for your salvation. But even as believers, we need to be treated with caution because, as Timothy reminded his young friend, as Paul reminded his young friend Timothy, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now whilst Paul was speaking specifically about money here, the lesson he wanted Timothy to learn is applicable to anything we strive for. He did not state that money is evil, rather the love of it is. That is because this intense desire for something, whatever that something may be, can lead us away from God, whereupon it becomes the object of our affections. So the question each of us who profess to know and love the Lord needs to ask ourselves is, where do our hearts really lie? Who or what are we really trusting in? So having warned his disciples about greed and pointed out his folly, Jesus then moved on to teach them about the remedy for greed. The remedy for greed. This he did in verses 20 to, 22 to 34 of a reading, where he emphasized how they can rely upon and trust in God for everything. Now Christ wasn't promoting idleness here. Work is, after all, a creation ordinance. He is merely stressing the point that affairs of the, world, the affairs of this world can so entangle us, we can easily forget who God is and be distracted from our true calling as his disciples. To counter this, Christ instructed his disciples to seek first his kingdom, and these things will be added to you as well. Matthew's record of this statement is a little bit fuller. It says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. So what Christ meant was make the membership and work of God's kingdom the focus of your life, not provision for yourself. As I stated earlier, this doesn't mean becoming idle and expecting others or God to provide for you. Rather, it means viewing your environment, wherever that may be, as a mission field where God has placed you to be his witness. The Apostle Paul put it another way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therein he said, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And then he followed it up by saying, I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so they may be saved. These words shine a light on Paul's priorities in life. Namely, to glorify God and win as many people as possible for Christ. He didn't care what others thought about him or said about him, or did to him, so long as he was able to achieve his aim. As he said so succinctly in his letter to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ. Is it any wonder then that with such a focus in life, Paul was able to find contentment in all circumstances? With this in mind, those who profess, those of us who profess to know and love the Lord, need to ask ourselves if we have the same priority as Paul. Is our foremost concern to glorify our Father in heaven by our attitude and actions as we interact with others 
in the course of carrying out our earthly responsibilities? Is our desire to see or to benefit others and see those still living in the darkness of sin to be one for the kingdom of God? Such questions are important to consider because when this becomes our focus in life, important though material provision may be, when we derive our contentment from being faithful to God, we can be thankful that with what we have and not chase after the false promises of greed. Christ is the greatest treasure any of us can have. He alone can provide us with what we actually need. Reconciliation with God through the forgiveness of our sins. So it is only when we put him at the centre of our lives that we will want for nothing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the riches that we have in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that through faith in him we are ransomed, healed, restored and forgiven people. Help us, O Lord, not to neglect such a salvation. Help us, O Lord, not to to drink from the empty vessels of this world. But, Lord, only to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Amen. We're going to stand a singer closing hymn. Come, you thankful people, come. able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, 
majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.